This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. Yep, good. Good morning. Great to see you all. Yeah, we are in the middle, I would say, just before the middle probably, of a series that we have entitled what God is saying to us. And I think it's fair to say, with a title like that, it acknowledges the fact that our God is a speaking God. Many of us can testify to that with answers to prayers and words of encouragement that have come over the years. And we stand with that sort of confident position that our God is a speaking God and as I was preparing today for today and praying about the framework that I would use because first of all I had to get something that I felt God was saying that was relevant and I, I felt was 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 the now word for us as a as a as a church family that would fit in to our context here. So while I was preparing and thinking of a framework at how I could frame this message, I, I felt very prompted to spend some time bringing some context uh, to the idea that God can and will speak to us and highlight some of the ways that he can do that. So today, is as much of a journey it's as much about the journey as as it is about the destination the journey being how can we position ourselves to hear from god and the destination being what god actually says to us when he speaks and our journey with God is, is a lifelong one. It's a lifelong commitment. And it's meant to be a continuous adventure, if I could be bold enough to use that word, of hearing from Him and moving with Him. And hearing from Him and moving with Him. I was reminded of a word of encouragement that God gave to Carl uh, a while back, saying that he would give us one piece of a jigsaw at a time, revealing more and more of the picture as we were given the next piece. It's an image that relies on us trusting God every single step of the way as we are guided by him. So when I say the journey itself is as important in many ways as, as the destination as, of what God is saying, it's how the process works to hear from Him. So I thought today's approach would be useful for anyone who was relatively new with us or unfamiliar with the idea that God is a speaking God or maybe downright skeptical that God is a speaking God. Because he speaks in a variety of ways. And probably the most obvious way is through the Bible. And the Bible is often referred to as the Word of God. God speaking to us through his written word. Words that were given to many different authors over many different centuries who were each inspired and directed by the Holy Spirit to record events and document what God, what, was saying, what God was saying to them. So the Bible has many different authors, each inspired by one author, God the creator of all things. The Apostle Paul, in one of his letters to Timothy, 
uh, his young disciple who was in charge of one of the churches, delivers the same verdict about the Old Testament scriptures, which at the time of his writing were considered to be the Word of God available to his readers. Two Timothy three verse sixteen reads, "All Scripture is God breathed." It's a, a visual description because when you think about it, you can't speak without breathing. You can't speak without breathing. It's biologically impossible. Words travel on our breath as if I hold my hand here I can feel my breath coming out as I'm speaking to you so this idea that Paul creates in our minds that all scripture is God breathed words travel on our breath without breath our lips would move but there would be no sound so when Paul calls all scripture God breathed, it creates this image, doesn't it, of God's words coming out of his mouth, carried on his breath, recorded by different authors of his choosing. Similarly, when we think about the gospel accounts documenting the life of Jesus and the various letters that make up what we now know as the New Testament. Jesus told his disciples that they were to be his witnesses, testifying about him and speaking the message of good news about his life, death, and resurrection. And these followers of Jesus, these disciples, went on to write the books of the New Testament and the letters of the New Testament, inspired and helped by the breath of God, by his Holy Spirit. Jesus' words to his disciples, taken from John 16, verses 12 to 14. I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. God speaking through his Holy Spirit. So the Old and New Testaments are the words of God breathed by him, given to various authors over many years in different locations, but all originating from the same author, God himself. Another way God speak to, speaks to us is through his Holy Spirit. As we've just heard in John 16, it's the Holy Spirit who will guide us into all truth speaking only the things that he hears. So we have the written word of God, the Bible, and we have the living and active Holy Spirit who continues to speak to the followers of Jesus. The Apostle John, one of Jesus' closest disciples and closest friends, records these words of Jesus to his disciples in John chapter 14, reading from verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he, le he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So here we have the reassuring promise that Jesus gives all those who surrender their lives to him, 
having heard the good news of the gospel that says Jesus gave his life in order to pay the price for our sin. And the reason for that so we could be pardoned and released from the death sentence that was a result of mankind's rebellion and rejection of God. The outcome, the outcome of Jesus' sacrifice, the result of him taking the punishment meant for us is that we are now accepted by God and adopted as members of his family. No longer orphans, Jesus says. Instead, we now have God as our Father, and not only that, we are equipped to live a life that brings honor to him. Not in our own strength, as many make the mistake of trying to do, doing it our own way. But instead, we're empowered and guided by his Holy Spirit, who will be with us and in us. They're not my words, they're Jesus' words. Jesus promises that everyone who believes in him and calls him Savior and Lord can experience his Holy Spirit on the inside. So why am I saying all of this? Because an awareness of the ways God is able to speak to us and an understanding of how to position ourselves ready to hear him are necessary and essential on the journey that he is taking us on. It's like receiving those individual pieces of a jigsaw that God is giving us one piece at a time that Carl told us about. God is reminding us all that him speaking is not exclusively reserved for a chosen privileged few. It's available to all who believe, all who believe in his Son, and are filled with his Holy Spirit. Amen? Which is why I wanted to highlight some of the most common ways that God speaks to us, both through his written words and through the nudging and prompting of his Holy Spirit. But in order for God to speak to us individually, what we need to do is to put some, dare I say it, effort in. Wow, ooh, uh-oh. I've used the E word. Now, some people get a bit jittery when the word effort is used in, 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 in a church context. But God is not opposed to effort. God is opposed to earning. There's a difference. There is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 8, for it is, it is by grace that you've been saved through faith in Jesus. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. We can't earn it. No actions that we take are ever going to be good enough to enable us to achieve our salvation. No good deeds can undo the sins that we have committed. Salvation is a gift that only God himself can provide. But once we receive this gift of salvation, we are told again by Paul in Philippians 2 verse 12, to work out your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out. There's some effort involved. For it is God who works in you, Paul says, both to will and to work his good pleasure. It's important to note that Paul doesn't say work for your salvation. He doesn't say work for your salvation. That would be earning salvation. He says work out your salvation. Paul here is not speaking to unbelievers. He is speaking to a community in Philippi that he's writing to, a, a community of Christian believers who have been saved, who have been forgiven, who have been rescued, 
and in whom God has placed his Holy Spirit. It's a finished, completed work accomplished through his Son, Jesus, who died on a cross in our place. Paul is actually saying that we are to be actively committed to obeying God in our daily living. That's our working out our salvation. That's where effort comes in. In our personal conduct and in our faithfulness to Him. This is an ongoing lifetime process that we step into at the point of our salvation. But then continue in it as a lifelong committed process. And this involves us taking up a posture of leaning in. We've used that phrase before, haven't we? Leaning into what God is saying to us through reading His Word, through prayer, through times of, of personal prayer and worship, and corporate times of, of worship. That's why I would encourage you, come along on a Thursday night to encounter. Because that's when we allow God to speak to us and hear from Him as we engage with Him in a time of praise and worship. And then God begins to unlock things and turn on light bulbs and different words come of encouragement. So be here. There's a little prompt for encounter Thursday, 7.30. But as you can see, it involves a degree of discipline. It involves a degree of effort in order to do that. This is the working out our salvation. Call it what you want, a, a, a determined mindset, an attitude of expectancy. But it all positions us ready to hear when He speaks. For those of you who with good memories, in last week's morning prayer meeting, I used the quote about expectation and it was from an American salesman and, and motivational speaker, no longer with us, uh, the late Zig Ziglar. Zig was a, was a, um, a nickname. Um, which said, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. It takes effort and discipline to aim to meet with God. That's why the psalmist instructs us, doesn't he, in Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. The way to make a move towards God, to get on the right path, to aim to meet with him, to get in that intimate place where he can speak, or through the gates. It's an image the psalmist is using of getting close to God, getting through the gates and into the courts. You're moving closer in, in, into the courts of the king. And your aim is to get in the throne room where you're face to face with the king, face to face with the presence. And it's all through an attitude of thanksgiving and praise. That's why we, 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 we give priority to so just being open to what God is saying to us in praise and worship, it's not just to fill 30 minutes. It's with a, a, an aim and a purpose. And that's why I want to encourage you, church, to take aim. Take aim to meet with God. Because if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. As Cole mentioned, and God has spoken to me, by the way, this is my long introduction. As Cole mentioned, when we met for the day as an eldership team back in August, it was with the purpose of being in a place where God was able to speak to us about the path and the journey ahead. And we've already heard some of the words that have, that have come from that, that time that we spent, the six of us, at, at Cole's house. But I want you to know we started with a time of prayer, a time of praise, and a time of worship. And it was out of that that words came. 
words that we've used to build messages around. And I wanted to use the same biblical principle to enable me to hear something fresh from God that I could bring today. I heard something on the day, but it, it, was, it was simply about staying in step. Uh, do you remember that word that Ben had about taking the brambly path? taking the path that was littered with brambles. And I felt I had something that was, sometimes we'll be able to move more quickly than others. But we need to stay in step because sometimes the terrain is difficult and we need to slow down and just take stock of where we're stepping. And sometimes it'll be a bit clearer, the path, and we'll be able to speed up. But I didn't feel that that was the word that I, I needed to bring today. So. What I did was, I'm just giving you the process to help you. I, I hope you see what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm giving you some of the processes that we can put in place. I, I, I don't want to use the word formula because God isn't a formulaic God. But there are uh, principles in Scripture that tell us how to enter His presence. So I'm just trying to share that and remind us of that. And I, I wanted to be able to, uh, uh, to hear something fresh from God. And one of the reasons why I asked Col, I spoke to him last week, about including uh, one of today's worship songs, Worthy of It All, which we've, we've just sang. Because that was the catalyst for me hearing just a very couple of simple lines that God, I felt God gave me that I could build on and, and use to encourage people today. And I was singing along, many of you know, when we go to the sportsman's at Christmas, I take my iPad with me, and I, I've got a sort of a, a library of backing tracks on my iPad, and we, we'll use that for the Christmas carols up at the sportsman's, which is 11th of December, another little plug while I'm here. 11th of December at the sportsman's, come along. But I've got maybe about 70 or so worship songs on my iPad, which we use from time to time when we're shorter musicians. So I'll just use those at home in a, in a worship time. And I recently bought, Carl and the team brought back this Worthy of It All from uh, New Wine. And it had gone under our radar a bit. We hadn't uh, heard it before until obviously they experienced it in one of the corporate meetings at New Wine. So we introduced it here and, and did it at one of the encounter nights. And, and I downloaded this backing track and was using that just for my own personal worship time. And I was, I was praying to God at the time saying, Lord, what do you want, what do you want me to say? What, what word have you got for us that I could bring to your church family here? And I got the, the sense of the Holy Spirit dropping something into my mind. And it, whether it's because I'm comfortable in that sort of medium of, of just singing out what I feel God's saying and, 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 and singing out scriptures. Uh, but it, it was almost as if I was singing along with this song, You Are Worthy of It All, like we were this morning. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. And I, I almost felt like Jesus was responding with a reply. And this is what he said. I am the lion and the lamb. But what about you? Who do you say I am? I am the lion and the lamb, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And I was singing it. I am the lion and the lamb. But who do you say that I am? I am the lion and the lamb. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Now obviously that's great for my own personal worship time, but what I needed to do then, I needed to dig a little deeper. I needed to put a bit of effort in. And I made the connection through a passage, which the, in fact the original song is built around from Revelation. All the saints and angels, it's a picture of the, the throne room of God, isn't it? Bow before the throne. 
all the elders take their crowns and, and lay them, cast them before the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all. That's the, that's the chorus that it builds into. But I knew I had to look at that passage, Revelation 5. And it's where the Apostle John, when he's been, he's been basically put on a... a, a, a um, He's been exiled onto a penal colony, colony, one of the Greek islands, Patmos, which is probably a tourist attraction now because it's got a big the, a church of St. John on it. But at the time, it was probably a, a downtrodden, dusty Greek island where John was kept out of the way and out of trouble. And that Revelation 5, that picture comes from the image, the vision that he was given by God. But it's interesting when you read the opening lines of Revelation, which is a difficult book because it's a symbolic book. And, and it, it, it's, you know, it's full of symbols and numbers and, and beasts and dragons. And a lot of people step away and shy away from it for those very reasons that it, it's not the sort of literature that you're used to. And that's a, there's a reason for that. It's not the sort of literature we're used to. But John says how he leads into it. It's a letter that he's written to the churches and he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day when he gets this vision. So there's, he's almost indicating to the churches that he, that he was in a place of intimacy with God when he received this vision. He was in a place where he was able to hear what God was showing him and, and telling him. So even that in itself is an encouragement to the churches, the early churches that he was writing to, that God speaks. God speaks when John, on that isolated island, pictured, him, you know, pictured himself, Lord, what do you want to say to me? I come into your presence. John had the Old Testament scriptures. I enter your, your, your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. What do, you want, what do you want to show me, Lord? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and this is what he saw. And I'm just going to read from Revelation 5, verse 1. This is what John wrote to the churches. Then I saw at the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll, with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy? Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. There was no one worthy in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth, whatever he meant by that. Maybe he had a picture of the spiritual forces, demonic spiritual forces. There was no one worthy enough. There was no one powerful enough. There was no one with the authority to open the scroll. And this is John's response. I wept and wept because there was no one found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. It's a done deal. It's finished. He's triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. John goes on. Then I saw a lamb. So he's been told, don't worry, here's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he turns, and what's he expecting to see if someone says, there's a lion? Turns around, what does he see? A lamb. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. And I'm just going to paraphrase the next few verses for the sake of time. This lamb introduced by the angel to John as the Lion of Judah, who represents Jesus, has overcome death and remarkably is able to stand despite its visible wounds, which are still showing on the lamb. Because you, if you looked at that lamb, you say, with wounds like that, he shouldn't be able to stand. He shouldn't even be alive. But he's overcome death and remarkably is able to stand despite his wounds. And the lamb takes the scroll from God, 
the Father who sits on the throne, which results in all those gathered around that throne singing a new song. And the song itself is, is worth reading in full because it's just a great summary of what Jesus, who is the lion and the lamb. That was where I, you know, I had that line in my head. I am the lion and the lamb. This, it seems contradictory, but he's both. This is what the, everyone in the, around the throne sang. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Wow. If that's not a picture of the church of Jesus, what, what is it's a picture of the ultimate authority of Jesus, the lion and the lamb, the only one worthy to open the scroll held in the hand of God the Father. You see, Jesus is confident in his identity and authority. It, it tells us that in Scripture about his journey to the cross. It's almost like a little aside you know jesus knew who he was and what he had to do and he wouldn't ch change in any direction when people were trying to put him off his own disciples because he knew as cole said this morning for the joy that was set before him for the for the redemption and salvation of people from every tribe every nation jesus is confident in his identity and his authority. He says, I am the lion and the lamb. But the following line for the song that he gave me is a question. But who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And that's an important question because Jesus knows who he is, who he is. But he wants to know who do you say he is? And it's a question that he'd asked his disciples before. It was a scriptural question. In Matthew 16, he's, he's just testing the waters with his own disciples to see the crowd's reaction. What's the word on the street? What's happening out there, boys? Who are people saying I am? And they give various suggestions, a reincarnated prophet or even John the Baptist or whatever. But then he makes it very personal and says, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter steps forward and answers for the group, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. And the answer Jesus tells Peter was revealed to him by his Father in heaven. However that happened, whether it was an inspirational moment from the Holy Spirit, everything that Peter had seen that had gone before, the ministry that he'd seen, the miracles he'd seen, the words that Jesus had spoken that he'd never heard any man speak before. But he says, you are the Messiah meaning you are God's anointed one. The promised deliverer, the promised savior that the Old Testament scriptures point towards. The one that the whole of creation has been waiting for. That was Peter's answer. But today Jesus is asking each one of us, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? And it's a question that no one can answer for you. You can't defer it to someone else. You can't say pass. Press the buzzer. Next, please. Jesus only wants your answer. But if your answer today is the same as Peter's, 
You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. Then he wants to ask you another question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? It's the same question that he asked Bartimaeus, who was a blind man, if you read Mark chapter 10. Jesus is leaving Jericho with his disciples, and the crowds... There's a, there's a rumbling in the crowds. And Bartimaeus is a blind beggar on the roadside. And he heard that Jesus was coming through the rumblings from the crowd. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And Jesus is on his way past. And even though he couldn't see him, from all the stories that he'd heard, from all the eyewitness accounts, from all the miracles that he'd heard about, from all the, the words that no one had ever spoken before, he recognized who Jesus was in his heart. He couldn't see him with his eyes, but he recognized in his heart who Jesus was. And he recognized that Jesus was the only one who was able to help him. So he cried out as Jesus passed by, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If that was probably quiet. It's probably a lot louder than that, but I don't want to burst the, the sound. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He made the connection at who Jesus was, that he was from the root of David. He was the chosen one. He was the Messiah that they'd all been waiting for. His, his, his disciples didn't fully see her at the time. It's as almost they were the blind ones and Bartimaeus was able to see clearly. But he shouts, doesn't he? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus asks him, it seems a strange thing to ask to a blind man, but he asks it anyway. What do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus replies, Rabbi, teacher, I want to see. I want to see. It was something that Jesus could only do for him. So this is what I'm going to leave you with. So if you find yourself today recognizing who Jesus is from what you've heard and what you've sang and what you've seen and you know in your heart that it's only he that can help you because you can't do it by yourself. You can't do it by yourself. Remember God's word to us last week. I am bringing you to the end of yourselves so you will see what I can do. I am bringing you to the end of yourselves. The time of self-sufficiency is over and it's the time for surrender. The time for self-sufficiency is over and it's the time for surrender. So this is an opportunity to answer Jesus when he asks, what do you want me to do for you? And I would recommend, encourage, implore. Don't let the opportunity pass by. Don't stay silent because Bartimaeus could have easily stayed silent as Jesus passed by. But he didn't. He shouted, Jesus, I recognize who you are. You're the only one who can help me. Have mercy on me. But if he'd have stayed silent, what would have happened? He would have stayed where he was, begging at the side of the road for the rest of his life. So I just want to close in prayer and then give an opportunity for us to respond. Whether Gareth, maybe you could come up and play their keys just quietly, that worthy of it all. Just in the background, that'd be great. That's brilliant.
Yeah, Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God. Father, we thank you for, I, I thank you, Lord, for this word, for, for encouraging me, Lord, to persevere and to dig deeper and to listen to what you're saying. And, and we thank you, Lord, for your compassion, for your p- compassion towards us. We thank you, Lord, that your word is, is, is a light unto our path. It's a lamp unto our feet. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, who leads us and guides us. And we recognize your son, Jesus. We recognize him as the anointed one that Peter spoke about. You are the, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the Savior. And we recognize you, Lord, as our Savior and Deliverer. We recognize you, Jesus, as the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes through to the Father except through you. So, Father, continue to speak to us individually. Lord, I, I pray that people aren't offended, but they're encouraged today. Lord, to, 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 to seek your face. Lord, to not for words to be dropped in their lap from a platform, Father, but to seek to contribute, Lord, something themselves. Everyone has a song. Everyone has a hymn. Lord, everyone has a psalm. Lord, speak to people as they they get before you this week, Lord. Lord, let us hear great testimonies of your goodness, of how you've spoken into people's lives, into the darkness today. But continue to speak to us, Lord, and we acknowledge that you are the only one who can answer every one of life's questions. So we give you all the glory today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Thanks, guys. I don't want the opportunity to pass. I say, if you've got something on your heart, which is you need God to... You've felt God was speaking to you today, saying, what do you want me to do for you? You've recognized who I am. What do you want me to do for you? If you want that answering, there's people here who are happy to pray with you. You're in a safe place. You're in a very safe place to do that. But I was reminded when I was looking at that story of Bartimaeus, that he was sat by the roadside begging with a cloak on. And some Bible commentaries say that it was almost as if it was a a government-issued cloak, giving him the the right, the authority, to beg, to be a beggar. It was almost like a beggar's license. So he was an official beggar. But he'd been given an identity that wasn't his. He'd been issued this cloak and it labeled him as a beggar for life, a blind beggar for life. And the first thing he did when Jesus says, call him over, bring him over to me. The first thing he did, it says, is he throws his cloak away. Before he's even spoke to Jesus, he's thrown his cloak away. He's thrown away this false identity that the, the Roman Empire has placed on him. The government of the, of the day has, has labeled him with. Now that spoke to me when I read that. And maybe it spoke to someone here. That you need to shake off the label that someone's put on you. Anyway, I have spoke too long. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk.